I'm in Hong Kong, and beside me is one of the world's longest cable stay structures. That is the Stonecutters Bridge. This span is tackling a traffic nightmare. As an architect, I've studied some of the world's most incredible structures. And unlike anything I've seen before, this project will elevate bridge design to a completely new level. Given the fact that they're over a body of water and there isn't land on both sides of the tower, this seemingly insane method of construction was the only way to build this bridge. On the world's second longest cable stay span, I'm gonna take you to the unfinished edge. Have a look. While crews confront well, a critical deadline. You've gotta go faster. We'll never get this cable up today. Typhoon season is bearing down. And the two unfinished spans are just dangling in the wind. Look at that. You can see the bridge actually bow down like a diving board. To finish, they'll have to dodge some of the world's biggest container ships. But that gives you a sense of the traffic we had to deal with. Install some of the planet's heaviest stay cables. Whoa, 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 whoa. And hang off the edge of one of the city's tallest towers. Look where we are. Just take it in, man. is one of the densest cities on the planet. With over 7 million residents squeezed in to just over 100 square miles, it's three times as dense as New York City. A lot of people, a lot of cars, therefore a ton of traffic. And one of the busiest stretches in town is the main road from the city to the airport. In the past five years alone, traffic has more than doubled. And with 100,000 cars on it each day, it is almost at capacity. But adding a second route means crossing this 3,000-foot-long shipping channel and the Stonecutters Island. Now, the only way to do that, build one of the world's longest spans, Stonecutters. The Stonecutters Bridge is enormous. With a main span of over 3,340 feet long, it is the second longest cable stay bridge in the world. Building this bridge takes 65 steel deck segments, each weighing four to 600 tons. Twin roadways reach out from either shore, and until they touch, the growing spans, called cantilevers, bend like weighted diving boards. To keep them from falling over, the heavy concrete backspans act as a counterweight. But with just seven segments to go, the spans are reaching their maximum load. Their biggest challenge right now is to lift one segment a week and reach closure before typhoon season arrives in just three months. As the, as the cantilevers grow, so does the instability and you do not want to be at your maximum point of exposure in the beginning of typhoon season. Absolutely. And we're doing everything we can, working 24-7 to make sure that we actually attain that closure prior to the onset of the typhoon season. That's our big goal right now. Today, we are going to get to be a part of one of the most exciting aspects of building the Stonecutters Bridge. We're going to take that 480-ton road deck segment, float it out to the middle of the third busiest ship port in the world, and then lift it 300 feet into the air and extend this now over 1,000 foot long cantilever. So we're off to sea, heading to the center of the channel. And if you look at the distance right there, that gives you a sense of the traffic we had to deal with. Ships like those carry as many as 15,000 containers on them, and they're passing through this channel constantly all day. Every year, these ships carry 24 million containers through this channel. And these guys need to make their lift right in the middle of it. All right, so Dennis, right. this, this yes. is the bridge? Yes. So, what well, bridge of the, of the barge? The bridge of the barge. Yes. 
And what, what are these guys doing right here? Right now, we have already switched into uh, DP mode. That's to say, uh, the barge will be controlled by the computer system. Because there's still traffic in the channel, the barge can't use anchors, or passing ships would get caught in the lines. So this barge is using GPS. Satellites tell the barge its location. Then underwater thrusters fight against the current and the wind to keep the barge within four inches of the exact lifting target. So we have 0.5 knots of wind pushing us, and actually 0.2 tons of tide pushing against us. But we still have to maintain a stable position on the target. With the barge now in position, the lift can begin. That's all happening 20 feet above me on the segment itself. Hubert, above us are two main span lifting frames. Yes. They're basically cranes perched at the edge of the bridge segment. Yes. And that's what we're going to use to lift this piece? To lift, yes. To lift the segment. So if I understand this right now, that the bridge is basically like, like a big diving board. And then when the load starts to come yeah. on, it starts to dip on. down a yes. little bit. And then later, when you put the stay cables on, come back. it comes back. Yes. But today, while we're lifting this yes. load, that bridge above me, it's going to deflect down. Yes. That's, that's, that's astounding. Yeah. You know, Hubert, I'm kind of shocked how effectively this walkie-talkie acts as a structural diagram. <laughs> yes. Here comes the hoisting mechanism. So we're going to attach these four yellow connections to these massive lugs connected to the segment, four on the north side, four on the south side. And once secured, we're going to begin the lift. Even if the barge stays on target, it still takes muscle to pull these 660-pound brackets into place. We're done. We're connected. We're in position. We're all lined up. Once Hooper gives the go, this 500-ton road deck segment is going 300 feet over my head. OK, ready for lifting? Ready for lifting. Go ahead, sir. All right, you ready? Okay, start lifting. OK, stop. South side up. South side up. Well, the lift is off. Our barge is now free. And what you're looking at is something you simply do not often see. A piece of a bridge, a piece of a road deck, slowly floating above a channel of water up until its final location. If there has ever been a moment for you to understand what a cantilever really is, look at that. That describes the insanity of this process. You can actually see the bridge beginning to deflect actually bow down like a diving board under the weight of that piece. The span can bend up to two feet while the lift is underway. But after 45 minutes, it is done. And the only place to see it is up on the span. So, Hubert, the lift is complete. Are you a happy man? Of course. Well, there you have it. This new piece has been lifted up to level the road deck. Next step, take this piece Fasten it, weld it, and make this bridge 60 feet longer and that much closer to connecting to the other side of the bridge. Shipping traffic posed a challenge for engineers on the water. But they also had to deal with challenges on land. Both shores are densely packed with active container terminals. And one shore has almost no bedrock beneath it for the tower foundation. In the end, the best design was the one that took up the least amount of ground space. To really appreciate the elegance of the solution behind me, you have to understand what the alternative would have been. So if this was a suspension bridge, you would have had two big towers and one main cable spanned between the two of them. From that, hangers holding up the road deck. However, we would also have two massive anchorages on either side of the bridge pulling down all that tensile force. Now, because this is a cable stay bridge, what we have are cables pulling up the road deck, and all of those tensile forces are resolved in two simple, powerful compression loads in those towers. So it's elegant, and it has a tiny footprint. While stone cutters may have a relatively small footprint, its individual components 
are extremely large. A cable stay bridge is made up of three essential elements. You have the horizontal span, which is the road deck. You have your two main vertical supports, which are the towers. And what ties it all together are the tension cables. In total, Stonecutters has 224 stay cables connecting the towers to the deck. And today, they're installing one of the largest. So Nigel, take me through how, how heavy and how long this cable is. This cable weighs about 79 ton. And how long is it? It's around about just over 1,000 feet long. We've got to unreel it, yeah. and uh, we've got to install the tower socket. This is the heaviest stay cable we've got to put up, so it's a, it's, a, it's going to be an experience. 1,000 feet to my left, there's a winch that's beginning to, to pull in. We're going to drag that all the way down the entire bridge, and here it comes right now. They're putting tension in the line, going down 1,000 feet. The winch is starting to pull, and here we go. Look at it. Wow, look at this thing spin. The whole thing is turning. Here it comes. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, bye, bye. Now, as we unreel this, we have to be amazingly careful to never let this thing touch the ground. The cable has a delicate cover that can be easily damaged. In order to make sure this sagging cable never touches the road deck, we start to install these. They're called bogies. They look a bit like roller skates from the 50s, but essentially, we're going to give this amazing 1,000-foot-long snake wheels every six or seven feet. I'm totally getting the next bogey, by the way. That's a lot of bogeys to install, about 150 in total. So this, this is really the best solution? This is the only way to do it. It's old-fashioned, but it works. All 1,000 feet of the cable have been fully unfurled, and it's go time. There's just one thing left to do. Get this cable up 1,000 feet in the air. Coming up, installing one of the heaviest stay cables ever attempted atop one of the tallest bridge towers. It takes technical know-how and holy nerves of steel. Hold up one of the longest spans in history, 3,340 feet long. Stonecutter's designers had to rethink every aspect of bridge design, and one of the most critical was the cables. A tension cable is made up of a series of strands clustered together. The bigger the cable, the more wind drag. Now, here in Hong Kong, when you're standing in the middle of Typhoon Alley, the challenge is to make every aspect of the bridge as thin and dragless as possible. Case in point, the stay cable right here. If you'll notice, at seven inches, it's a thin cable, but they actually go a step further. They've dimpled the outside of the cable. On a smooth cable, in wind and rain, water forms rivulets. They add a small amount of additional width to the cable, about a 20th of an inch. But even that tiny extra thickness can catch wind and destabilize the cable. Now, adding dimples breaks up the water flow keeping the cable thinner and more stable in the wind. These are actually designed dimples, and by experimenting, we can check how that it works and get an optimum dimple configuration. And this pattern was developed in a wind tunnel, simulating rain and simulating Correct. wind. It actually stabilizes the bridge. In fact, dimpled cables move about five times less in wind and rain than smooth cables. But that thin, dimpled skin can be easily damaged. Each cable has up to 451 quarter-inch steel wires, but only a half-inch of poly skin for maximum thinness in the wind. Damage to the skin would let in moisture, thereby corroding the wires. If damage occurs, the cable must be replaced at a cost of more than $1 million and a month of lost work. One of the most dangerous times for the cable is during the next step, tower installation. Step one is complete. They got all 1,000 feet of the cable fully unreeled, and now it's time for step two. Frankly, step two is the hard part. These guys right here are prepping the rigging to get this cable 1,000 feet in the air. All right, so Nigel, our goal is to do what with this right here? Our task today is to get this tower socket up inside the tube, which goes inside the tower. So this is threading the needle. 
at 950 feet. Uh -huh. I mean, sort of incredibly small tolerance, super high accuracy, and it just so happens super high. That's period. right. That's right. So it's got super guys to do it, and that's me and you. Shoot zip, Shibu. Hey, Shibu, shoot zip. Hey, zip. This is the last chance we're going to have to see this cable. We're going to be anywhere near it. So before it goes up, all the protective covering, all the plastic comes off. This is it. This is the big dance for the cable. All right. Just like unwrapping a Christmas present. The danger is, by taking the covering off now, the unprotected skin is even more vulnerable to damage. But there's really no choice. It can't be removed once it's up in the air. All right. Well done. Good job. Finally, the cable is heading up. 950 feet on one of the tallest towers in Hong Kong, nearly the height of the Eiffel Tower. And I am going to join it. Good luck, Danny. <laughs> Not encouraging. <laughs> Top of the world, huh? To the top of the tower. I'm now up at the level of 950 feet, hanging on the outside of the concrete tower. This somewhat weird orange curved metal apparatus is called the saddle. And basically, it acts as the guide, like a metal guide rail. So when the, when the cable finally makes it all the way up to 950 feet, the guys will be out there using a winch to slowly guide the cable up this curve. That curve's exactly the geometry needed to fit the hole and thread the needle. In order to do that, you have to get out on the saddle and on that deck, perched out, well, really over nothing. <laughs> I mean, just perched out over nothing. So I'm going to go up from here, over, and then down the saddle to meet the cable out there. Just want to illustrate that. That's the footing. There it is. Don't step there. Yeah, very, very slightly. That's very slippery, yeah. So at present, the tower crane is holding the load and the cable is sitting right at my feet. As soon as it comes up, what we're gonna do is switch over from the tower crane to the winch and then to slide the cable forward onto the saddle. Are you ready? Are you ready? Does anybody wanna hug before we start? No? Just wanna go ahead? All right, so let's just do it. Let's go ahead and do it. There's our cable right there. The quarter ton cable socket is dangling from the tower crane. They've got to transfer it to a three-ton winch located inside the tower. But in order to make that shift, they'll have to step off the relative safety of the saddle and onto the cable itself. Holy There it is, guys. Here it is. This is it. Look at him. That's sick. He's up on top of the rigging. We've connected our cable to our winch and have now taken the load from the tower crane. The crane has a lot of the weight, but now we have three tons of it. Next, we're gonna call the guys inside the tower who will pull on that winch and we'll lay this cable flat on the saddle and hopefully get it up in time so I can get off this thing. TB makes the call inside to start up the tower winch. It's like a snake. It's like a cobra rising its head. Oh my God, whoa, whoa, is that okay? Okay, stop the winch, stop the winch. Okay, stop, winch is stop. It's an amazingly tight fit, and they're still a little bit off. So they're using chain blocks and come along to basically move the thing. But keep in mind, we're talking about a 79-ton cable. So you can't kind of like just jimmy it and push it. All right, TB, is it ready to go in the hole? Yes, go ready to go in the hole, yes. All right, pull the winch. Let's do this. OK, wind. One, two, three, pull. It's, su it's such a tight fit. They have to be so precise. As it moves into the tube, it has less than a tenth of an inch of tolerance. And if it's damaged up here, the entire cable comes down. And the crew is to start over from scratch. We've gotten through the outer threshold, so that's a huge, huge step. So now we know we're lined up. The next step is the winch can really start pulling and guide this thing up the saddle. The crew in the saddle wraps up. 
But deep inside the tower, another crew is hard at work, locking the cable into place. What we're about to do is actually descend into the hollow tower, because there's actually a hollow tube of concrete down, what, about 40 feet? About 40, 50 foot, foot, yeah. To where the team right now has the winch pulling the cable, threading it through that hole. So now this is the, uh, the end of the cable, essentially. Uh -huh. And the only thing keeping this cable from slipping through this hole and falling down 1,000 feet is this collar right here. That's the anchor collar, yeah. And so basically, it's just like a big kind of thick dog collar. That's all it is. Once the socket is inside the tower, the 175-pound steel anchor collar slides around its neck. It's about three inches wider than the anchor hole to keep the heavy cable from sliding back out. So all of this weight pushing against this, this anchor block uh -huh. right here uh -huh. is just essentially locking it against the tower. That's right, yeah. And all that weight creates such a friction bond yeah. that it's stuck. With the collar in place, this end of the cable is complete. There's one more step to pulling this cable tight, and it's happening down on the deck. So now that Nigel and the guys have the cable installed on the very top of the tower, as you can see, like a loose guitar string or a a thousand foot long piece of spaghetti, the cable droops all the way down to here. Now the next step is to get the far end installed into the road deck. Come on. A 30 ton winch pulls the cable towards the deck anchor hole, where it will be ultimately installed and tightened into place. Now to help tighten that cable, they've attached something new. A steel rod that's threaded like a screw. So what I'm looking at is actually a, an enormous, like, like 35 foot long screw. Screw. That will go into the jack and get turned. That's right. And as, get... and as you turn it, yeah. you'll be actually tensioning the cable. That's right. So the question I have, it's a fascinating mechanism. Who actually decides the color of the blanket you're going to wrap it in? <laughs> because the deck anchor is angled, they'll have to lift the screw in the cable to 40 degrees so it can fit in the hole. What we're going to do now is using this winch right here, this cable. Here, follow me. We're going to take this cable, watch your step, up and over this rigging and down into its hole right there. Below the anchor hole, three strong jacks will grab the screw rod, pulling the cable tight with two million pounds of force. But until the deck install is completed, that hanging cable is a danger to the rest of the bridge. If the wind gets up tonight, we'll never stop it from swinging around. And we're talking about a cable that in total weighs 79 tons. 79 ton, moving around, you'll never stop it. This means Nigel's crew will be here working the rest of the day and all night. As the sun sets in the hazy Hong Kong skyline, this cable has finally made its way to its location. And by morning, this cable will be as taut and tensioned as each and every cable along the body of the bridge. Coming up, engineering to survive typhoon winds of up to 200 miles per hour. Humans have built bridges for thousands of years, and each one faces engineering challenges. The Stonecutters Bridge in Hong Kong is no exception. Every bridge designer's worst nightmare is a collapse. The three most common types of bridge collapses happen from number one, collision from an oncoming vessel. Here in Hong Kong, they've mitigated that problem by raising the road deck over 200 feet in the air and locating the two towers on land, thereby leaving open the channel for ship traffic. The second type of collapse is from an earthquake, a seismic event. Here in Hong Kong, they're fortunate this is not a seismic zone. Third and finally, wind. Every bridge in the world has its own resonant frequency, like a guitar string. But if the wind hitting the bridge matches that frequency, the bridge will start to vibrate. In 1940, that's exactly what happened to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It collapsed in winds of just 42 miles per hour. Yet Stonecutters has a much bigger challenge. Sitting in Typhoon Alley, it faces winds of up to 150 miles per hour, with gusts that can top 200 miles an hour. How do you take on the challenge of a typhoon? 
as you can see, we're actually sitting right on the coast, so we have typhoons that come up off of the, uh, off of the ocean quite readily, and we're exposed wide open to that. Last season, we had uh, four very significant typhoons come into the area, which really caused a huge disruption in our uh, construction schedule. To avoid the same fate as Tacoma Narrows, Stonecutter's deck was designed with a gap in the middle that releases wind energy. Behind me, you can see the north and south road decks and that design that mimics the underside of an airplane wing. So wind comes in off the harbor, gets sent under that curved side of the bridge, and then released through the center space, thereby minimizing flutter and keeping the bridge smooth and safe. But aerodynamics alone won't stop the bridge from vibrating in the wind. It also needs to be made as strong and stiff as possible. And that's done by welding the new segment. That weld, that connection process, is happening right in here. Joining the top of the segments together is done by machine, not man. OK, so this is robot welding, automatic, not manual. So we set the speed, the current, the voltage. And once we're totally happy and ready, we hit start. He puts his hand in some very, very dangerous weld situation. And we move forward. So Gong, are we ready? OK. Start. And we're off. The robot welder has to make six passes on the surface. Now, to help it go faster, it churns out a white sand called flux. Like insulation, flux keeps heat in the weld, melting the steel faster so the robot can move quickly along the joint. You know, of all the welding jobs on the, on the site, this is sort of one of the nicer ones, really. Hit start. Get time with your friend. Talk. Or you can not talk, really. I mean, it's, it's really up to you, which is one of the great things about robot welding. It's okay? It is okay. But the perimeter weld is just the beginning. In fact, most welding is done by hand on the sides of the segment. But the deck's real strength comes from steel ribs welded on the inside. We are inside the cross girder of the bridge at the moment. So this is that, that beam that connects the north and the south road deck? Yes. From here on in, I suggest you wear this. It is a little fumy. That's the smoke from the welding. Where I'm standing right now is essentially inside a brand new segment. And I just came from a previous segment. That's correct. This is the older segment. This is the new segment. And that's the joint right there. So after this first perimeter weld is done, the two sections are fused. But now the next step is to stiffen them. What we do is we join the bones of the bridge together to give the new segment the strength to hold itself up. The bones of the bridge are called U-troughs. They line the interior of each segment and connect to the span with an infill to bridge the gap. Once all 110 U-troughs are joined, they act like ribs, giving the span strength and rigidity to withstand the wind. So let's do it. Let's make some bones. Oh, let's do it. OK. So there's the infill piece. Fits quite nicely. So as you can see right here, that's the old segment. This is the new segment. This is the infill piece that ultimately bridges the gap and will transform two individual U-troughs into one long, continuous girder. Welding together all of these U-troughs is no small task. Now the real work begins. For the next five days and five nights, these guys will be in here. Grinding, welding, and fitting. So this new segment becomes fused to the previous segment. Now, just so you fully understand that this is indeed the most recent piece installed, have a look. Coming up. Topping off one of the tallest towers in Hong Kong. Here it is. The bird cage is right over my head, and it's starting to come down. It is about five feet from my ends right now. 
when the Hong Kong government decided to build its longest cable stay bridge, they wanted something that would stand out not just as a bridge, but also as a piece of architecture. And given the Hong Kong skyline, where everything is tall and everything is wild and different and dense, the design that won the competition wasn't the most outlandish, but rather the most subtle. A pair of 1,000-foot-tall concrete and stainless steel towers that cut through the sky by day, but glow at night. And that glow will come from enormous nightlights perched atop each tower. And right now, they're installing the last one. Today, the crew is attempting to lift something called the birdcage. This right here is the very crowning jewel that sits atop the highest point on the tower. This is like a, like a huge light bulb, essentially. Yes, with computerized coloring and all this stuff. Sitting about 1,000 feet in the air. Uh, yes, it's true. During the lift, wind is the top concern. If it exceeds 33 miles an hour, the lift will have to stop. Otherwise, the birdcage dangling from the crane's parallel wires could spin out of control as it nears the tower top. So your challenge is, as this thing goes up is to make sure those two wires remain parallel uh -huh. the entire way. Yes. Despite the wind. <laughs> yes. Nice. Good. Fun. <laughs> All right, let's do it. You ready? Yes. So already we're at about, what, 200 feet right now? Yeah. And it's the swing right now. Oh, it's so close to the deck right now. All right, it's on top of the deck. It's going over. They got, they got, they got, they cleared the deck. We're now standing uh, about 30 feet above the deck level, and you can see the birdcage has arrived safely. First stage of the lift went well. And the good news is, if you look up atop the birdcage, the wires are parallel separate. So thus far, we're in good shape. Well, this is it. We're going from 300 feet in the air to 1,000 feet in the air, and myself and Artie are going to follow it up. When we're standing on top of this tower, but we're going to be standing on a platform 23 feet wide. Here comes our ride. That's the hoist. It's going to take myself and Artie, and uh, we're going to meet this thing. So the birdcage is going up, and so am I. All right. This time, I'm going all the way up to the very top of the tower. Okay, so let's be very clear about it. We're now standing on the top of the tower, 977 feet above the Hong Kong skyline. This is it. This 23-foot wide space is where we're going to put this birdcage in a minute. The crew is in luck. The wind has died down. Now they've got to anchor it for typhoon winds to come. We got 144 30 mm diameter bolts. 144 of these all yeah. around the perimeter. Okay. So why does the birdcage need that much support? The birdcage is supposed to design for more than typhoon number eight uh, wind, wind speed. So we're talking 200 mile an hour winds. Uh, yes. Here it is. The birdcage is right over my head, and it's starting to come down. This is the highest piece of the West Tower. This is the shining beacon on top of the Stonecutters Bridge. Here she is. She's coming down. Now that the bird cage has been lined up, last and final step, put on some bolts, line up the washers, and this bird cage is in its final resting place, 977 feet above the harbor. The bird cage is the crowning jewel atop towers that soar like skyscrapers. But for a bridge of this enormous size, its towers are breathtakingly thin. I mean, there's an emotional experience when you go over a bridge of this scale and this size. Yes, and we were hoping that it would have a sculptural effect, so that you have the towers and this, what I call the blade, going across the water. It's just like a blade. It's a very, very thin blade. The tower's thin, blade-like shape is stunning. But it causes an engineering problem. Typical cable stay bridges use towers shaped like letters, A, H, or an inverted Y. These forms are stable in the wind. By contrast, Stonecutter's towers are shaped like a much less stable letter I. On a typical bridge, when you have the kind of A-frame design, you have a sort of a wide center of gravity, which minimizes yeah. uh, swinging. Right, yes. What do you do when you have essentially a skyscraper? 
I mean, this, oh. is, this is as tall as the Eiffel Tower. If it was an air tower, yeah. from an engineering point of view, that's a very good solution. Right. Because it's, it's like a triangle is very stable. A single tower is, especially of a shape like this, this tower will start to move in the wind. To counteract this movement, designers added a pendulum inside. It's called a tuned mass damper. So for example, as the wind starts pushing this tower in the southbound direction, that and pendulum swings opposite. north. Yes. So every time I lean this way, it's that way, and it kind of goes right. in the opposite direction of me at all times. Right. And it will stop the motion. The ongoing game is to minimize the overall movement of any aspect of the bridge. Yes. The thin towers were an engineering challenge, but their skyscraper-like shape gave designers yet another way to light up the Hong Kong night. If you've ever been to Hong Kong, and if you've ever been here at night, there is one thing that you know about the folks who live here. They love to light up their buildings. And because the Stonecutters Bridge is one of the newest additions to the skyline here, it is no exception. So because the bridge is remarkable, because the bridge is so special, mm -hmm. you're going to light this up just like a skyscraper. Exactly. And these are high-powered lights? High-powered LED lights. The life of the LED is 50,000 hours. You're telling me that you could, if you wanted to, install this light, turn it on, Hi. leave it on 24 hours a day for six years. Exactly. Each tower will have 1,512 LED light panels. And BJ's team has to install and test each one by opening day, just nine months from now. So they are on a strict schedule. Each day they have to accomplish an installation of eight LED lights. Exactly. And right now the sun is about to set. Yeah. So we're going to head up to the tower uh -huh. to install some of the last lights. Exactly. Exactly. Jump over cables. Mm. This is great. So essentially, yeah. BJ, there's a gap. There's a gap. It's almost 25 mm. So there's a 25 millimeter recess yeah. when, when the two steel sections come together. And it's in that recess where you put your lights. Yeah. The lights fit into a one inch groove running 400 feet up the side of the tower. This is it. We're going to install right here? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's do that. Here it comes. You got hands on it? OK. You know, it's just like a couple of electricians. And Good. Um, this is some serious effort. Part of the idea of using an LED is because you do not want to come up here more than you have to to replace these things. Precisely. Because look where we're standing. Almost near the heaven. Almost. Up next, finishing this bridge means lighting up the Let's night. Come on. There it is. And risking life and limb. It will take your finger off very, very easily. On the world's second longest cable stay bridge, crews are working around the clock to complete the span. Because typhoon season arrives in just three months. So this is this is really what you're up against, this, this non-negotiable deadline. Absolutely, yes. And uh, from day one to day 10 year and one, there is no difference in pressure. It was, it was intense then, it'll be intense to the very last day. When we cut that ribbon, it'll still be up to that moment. Very, very, very intense work. This is a race to the end. Race to the end, absolutely. But before they can reach the end, each segment must be turned from raw, dirty steel into a clean roadway. Once the segment has been installed, welded, fitted out, and inspected, the next step in the process is blasting and painting. All right, so first step of the process, got to clean it, otherwise known as grit blast it. Rip off all the rust, all the decomposition, all the slag, and get the steel prepped and ready to be painted. This tube called a blasting hog, can shoot grit at 450 miles an hour. So when it's turned on, we're pushing the compressed air through the tube, along with a copper aggregate that sort of tears off all the, all the, all the rust and stuff on the steel? Yes, and it actually leaves a, a profile of, a rough profile on the surface. We're cleaning it, but we're also giving it a slightly rough finish yes. so that paint will grab onto it. Yes. 
Blasters clean the outside and inside of the bridge, every inch of welded steel. So where are we actually doing the grid blasting this afternoon? We, we blasted the joint area. There's not a great deal of space in this, this workspace, Dennis. It is a confined area. It is very difficult, and it is actually very dangerous. So essentially, this was one segment, this was another segment. This piece was welded to bring them together. So the goal is to take these sections and get them smooth, clean, and consistent. When it's finished, it will just be perfectly clean steel. Beautiful. But because blasting churns up clouds of metal dust, workers wear a protective hood. I just want to point out before we get started here, um, Gong and I are not going to a costume party, OK? This is just the safest way we have to be to do this operation. But Gong, when we start, everybody else goes away, right? Everybody down? OK. OK, Gong speaks no English. I speak no Chinese. This is very dangerous, but it's going to be awesome. To avoid the toxic metal dust, my cameraman has to stay far away. Gong, well done, my friend. Well done. So the smoke is cleared, and I'm pretty sure you're going to be impressed when you see the steel. Come on. Yeah. Look at that, huh? The infill steel, the old segment, and the new segment. Now, this sandpaper-like surface that Gong and I just crushed is ready for paint. Paint is the last step. It keeps the steel segments from corroding in the marine air. I, I presume, given the salt air, uh, from the water, this is a very non-corrosive type of paint. It is, yes. This iron oxide paint is a powerful protective coating that's applied with power tools. This is not a paintbrush kind of situation. There's no rollers involved. No, we are applying this with a, an airless spray. It uses compressed air. It will take your finger off very, very easily. If it was to go into your hand, you would actually inject the paint into your, into your hand or into other parts of your body. It is that powerful. Let's paint. All right, so the site that we're going to be painting is on the side, sort of the side of the cross section, on the inside edge of the segment. OK. So Gong and myself are now under the bridge segment. They built a kind of a makeshift painting gantry to make sure the paint doesn't uh, escape out into the water, which is great for marine life, uh, saying nothing for the life of the painters and myself here. So the skin has been grip blasted. It's put on the coat of primer. That was OK. Every inch of metal, nearly 4 million square feet of it, gets five coats of paint. That's like painting 300 football fields one foot at a time. As the painters ramp up operations on the unfinished roadway, electricians are almost done turning the towers into the city's tallest Christmas tree. And right now, it's time to find out if those newly installed lights actually work. So, BJ. Hi. The last light has been installed. The bolts are tight. The installation is good. Yes, Denny. Stonecutter's Bridge. First light test, installation. Check it out. BJ, give me Christmas. You got it. Come on, come on. Let's go. Turns on. Come on. There it is. Stonecutter's oh. Bridge. One of the tallest two towers, longest cable stay spans, and the newest addition to the Hong Kong skyline, thanks to BJ right here. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. He is offering the citizens of this town Christmas every single day of the year. It's kind of amazing. It's amazing. It's crazy and amazing. The crew has got just six final segments to put in place. And if they succeed, when opening day arrives, Hong Kong's traffic will flow smoothly across this record-setting bridge. If all goes well, if you come back here in one year's time, you'll see not just one of the longest cable stay spans ever attempted, but as far as I'm concerned, one of the most gorgeous bridges I've ever seen.